Thank you to, to all the organisers. It's a great pleasure once again to be uh, talking to an ICGB GB, uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, I, I echo what, what you've just said. I hope very much we'll be able to meet in person sometime over the next year. And uh, as you've already alluded to, what I wanted to uh, uh, talk about today was to tell you something about uh, the dark genome, uh, what it is, and how we're using mouse genetics to really probe and illuminate uh, the dark genome. And I'll do this, I'll illustrate this by talking about the activities of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, which are building the first uh, comprehensive catalog uh, of mammalian uh, gene function. Uh, it's, and through that, of course, I should add, delivering for genomic and uh, precision medicine. So uh, let me give you uh, some of the, the, the context and, and, and the challenge uh, that's ahead of us. Much of the mammalian genome is dark. The function of the majority of the genes in the mouse and human genomes are unknown. You may find this surprising, but there's a th there are thousands of genes for which we know very little uh, about function and their relationship to disease. And also the functional consequences of human genetic variation, uh, mutations in the human genome are very poorly understood as well. And the uh, functional analysis of the various elements of the non-coding genome and how they contribute to disease are also very limited. So overall, variants of unknown significance, uh, the, the numbers of genetic variants in the human population that are, are, are not understood is increasing very rapidly, but that's not being met by a commensurate analysis of function. The mouse is critical to dissect and understand the importance of genetic variation. And that's really the, the, the theme of my, my talk today. So let me tell you a bit about uh, the dark genome and, and what it is. And I, I uh, exhort you to go and look at this, this review in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery from Tudor Apre and colleagues a few years ago, where he divided the genome into various categories. I'm really going to talk about the T-dark category the other categories are genes where there's considerable knowledge about function, and in some cases, sufficient knowledge about function that uh, clinical therapeutics have been developed and so on. But if we look at the dark genome, the black genome, uh, you can see that in, in terms of comparison to genome, uh, uh, genomes and genes that we know about, in terms of abstracts, information on uh, gene function, resources to study function, such as the availability of antibodies. This is a part of the genome that has fallen to the bottom of the pile. And we see that, in fact, there's very little investigation of this part of the genome in terms of grants or patents and, and so on and so forth. There's a vicious cycle of ignorance developing here, whereby the dark genome tends to remain dark. So why does it per persist? Well, in a very important paper a few years ago, Stöger et al. in PLOS Biology investigated the reasons why potentially important genes in the genome, genes that on further investigation may lead to new opportunities for diagnosis, understanding of disease mechanism or new therapeutics, why they are missed and are not investigated. Well, they found an extraordinary relationship that publications that are currently appearing tend to be about genes which there are already publications on earlier in the life cycle. We can see this very strong co correlation and genes for which there have been few publications in the past are rarely investigated in the future. In contrast, genes for which have been, have been investigated and looked at in detail, and there's a, sufficient, a, a very significant uh, publication index are those that tend to be investigated. We build on existing studies and data rather than venturing out into novel pastures. This was really the foundation of the IMPC, the recognition that there's a huge dark genome out there and without the study of that particular genome, that part of the genome, we will not be able to uncover key findings that will push forward genomic and precision medicine. It is, the dark genome is a major risk uh, to everything that we do 
uh, in biomedical sciences. So the IMPC, which was founded in 2011, set out to generate comprehensive genome-wide knowledge of gene function, applying high throughput production and phenotyping approaches to illuminate the dark genome, to deliver transformative insights into that unexplored landscape, and through that to provide new opportunities for therapeutic insight and new approaches to genomic and precision medicine. So the IMPC goals over the last 10 years, this year we're celebrating our 10th anniversary, are relatively straightforward. In principle, uh, it was to generate a mouse null mutant for every gene in the genome, but going into the dark genome as much as the known genome, to take each of those mutants and comprehensively phenotype them using standardized approaches, and thus to determine a baseline for mammalian gene function, and through that to provide insights into the genetic basis of diseases, all the way from rare disease uh, to complex disease. And to do this, of course, we could, this, couldn't, this uh, goal could not, this ambition could not be achieved by one or even a few labs. A global consortium was established involving major mass genetics research centers from over the entire globe, straddling uh, many of the continents, from North America through to Europe, uh, through to uh, Asia, and as far afield as Australia uh, and, and South Africa. A true global consortium, we're all contributing uh, to this challenge of providing a comprehensive catalog of mammalian gene function. Of course, once we created the null mutants, we didn't simply want to look at one or two phenotypes in them. Importantly, in terms of understanding the functions of genes and their relationship to disease, we need to know the multiple functions of genes, the pleiotropy. And to do that, we set up very comprehensive and standardized but robust phenotyping pipelines that are used across all of the research centers ac across, across the globe. Uh, we first of all establish whether the mutations we have, we create homozygotes for these mutations, whether they're actually uh, uh, viable or whether they're embryonic lethal. So we have an embryonic phenotyping pipeline where we look at mouse mutants that are embryonic lethal to see what, what causes the lethality. But we also have a major uh, adult phenotyping pipeline. So viable homozygotes uh, go through a large number of uh, tests uh, between nine and 16 weeks. And for those mutants, uh, which are um, uh, embryonic lethal, the heterozygotes go through the adult phenotyping pipeline as well. We do large cohorts of both males and females so that we can look at sexual dimorphism, which is something that I'll come back to later. Now, I don't expect you to uh, really grasp everything on this slide. This is simply to show all of the tests that we carry out in the IMPC pipeline on those cohorts of male and, and female mice. Uh, the, uh, you can see that for all of these uh, um, uh, tests, we cover a whole variety of disease areas from neurology, behavior, cardiovascular, muscul musculoskeletal, sensory, immune systems, and so on and so forth. We're really digging deep into the multiple fu functions, the pleiotropic functions of, of, of each gene. All of the data from the mouse clinics around the world that are generating both mutants and phenotypes come to the Data Coordination Center, which is actually here in the UK at MRC Harwell, where the data undergoes data validation, quality control checks, and some statistical analysis before it's deposited uh, in the core data archive, uh, which is the, at the European Bioinformatics Institute, the EBI uh, in Cambridge. There, uh, comprehensive statistical analysis is, is carried out on each of the mutants and their phenotypes to identify significant outliers that indicate that we've identified a new phenotype for that particular gene. And the data is released uh, in uh, uh, regular data releases. And I should stress, this is a good point to stress at this, this juncture, that all of the project is open access. The data is completely freely available, as are the, the mouse mutants available to the worldwide community and available to you, uh, those of you who are listening in at this course. So where have we got to with IMPC? Well, we've made enormous progress over the last 10 years. Nearly 10,000 uh, 
genotype confirmed null mutants have, have been uh, made to this date, and most of those have gone through the uh, phenotype pipeline. Data release 15, if you go to the IMPC website at mousephenotype.org, you can find more detail on this. You can look for your favorite gene and see what phenotypes we've found. You'll be looking at 107 million data points uh, with well over half a million images, all the way from x-rays to LAXZ staining and so on and so forth. This is high-end multi-dimensional data that is giving us a comprehensive insight into the multiple functions of genes and their role in disease. Now, I can't go into all of the aspects of the findings and the publications that have been produced from IMPC. I, 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 I exhort you again to go to the IMPC website to look at our full publications list, but it covers new disease models, new candidate genes, new functional knowledge about particular biological mechanisms, novel insights into gene function for a whole slew of diseases. An important paper that has shown that sexual dimorphism, because we're analyzing both males and females, is highly pervasive across uh, all of the genes that we've looked at. And obviously insights into human disease from the analysis of mouse uh, lethal genes. And I'll just tell you a couple of vignettes about what we found that emphasizes that novelty abounds what we've done in IMP has shown that our ignorance of the genome is perhaps more profound than we might have thought. There is a huge dark genome out there. If we look at pleiotropy, the multiple functions of genes, we can look at multiple functions because, as I've already indicated to you, there's an enormous number of procedures in IMPC which bear upon a whole number of disease systems. Very few of our mutants have got no phenotype, but pleiotropy, Multiple phenotypes for each gene is pervasive. And of course, that's extremely important in our understanding of disease. It provides comprehensive insights into the multi and comorbidities that are associated with each gene. And the potential morbidities, the potential phenotypes that we might look in the human population when we're uh, uh, disentangling a human disease and the mechanisms involved. I want to go back to a data release early on in the program, data release five. This was published in uh, Nature Genetics in 2017. The same message still applies to later data releases, and that is we looked at the new functional knowledge that we were generating in IMPC. We found that 90% of gene phenotype annotations had not been reported before. Over half of the genes phenotyped in this release had not had a mouse mutant produced. There was new functional knowledge for over a thousand genes. This is an extraordinary statistic. 90% of the relationships between genes and phenotypes had not been reported before. And this figure remains as we've gradually increased the number of null mutations analyzed to 10,000. We obviously look a lot at embryonic lethal uh, 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 genes. Uh, about 30% of the homozygotes are embryonic lethal or survival. And a third of each of these class of genes uh, had, had never been looked at before. There was no previously described phenotype and they're entirely novel. And if we look at a recent Nature Genetics paper reporting on the mutations produced from embryonic stem cells, we find that over half of the null alleles, no equivalent mutant mouse line exists. Many of the mutations we've created are entirely novel and exclusive to IMPC. We haven't really seen those genes before. They've remained part of the dark genome. Of course, we can't carry out this project and we can't have the appropriate impact in terms of the new findings uh, without uh, interactions and collaborations and cooperation across the globe between IMPC and other networks involved with diseases, uh, with rare diseases, with complex disease, uh, with other databases. And indeed that has been successful. We pushed very hard on that. And in, uh, by this year, we've reached 4,000 publications that have been produced by groups around the world have used either IMPC resources or data in their analysis. So we are having a worldwide impact and we look forward to uh, doing that further that reflects the open access and open nature of the resources that we've created. Wow. So I'm gonna finish now with talking a bit about a couple of points about the future challenges from 2021 onwards, now that we've re uh, reached our 10th anniversary. 
So overall, uh, including work by the IMPC, the global biomedical research community has generated knockouts for about 14, uh, just a bit over 14,000 genes. And I should emphasize that, in fact, there are around about uh, nearly 17,000 mouse genes that are orthologous to human genes. So we've got a little way to go. There remain uh, just over 3,000 orthologs without mouse null mutations. Uh, and of these, uh, we have around 1,000 where we have other types of mutations, missense mutations, gain of function mutations, and so on, where we have phenotypic information about the, those genes. So there remain about 2,000 genes which are candidates for generation of a null mutation, and the IMPC aims to finish those genes uh, over the next couple of years. But the big perspective going forward over the next year is to begin to take the work of the consortium, the capacity and the expertise that we have in beginning to throw more light, not just on providing the baseline null mutant catalog uh, of gene function across the mammalian genome, but to look in more detail at human genetic variation, uh, human mutations in coding sequences, in non-coding sequences, and asking more deeply probing questions about the function of that human genetic variation and its relationship to disease. So IMPC is generating pipelines to generate mouse models of human coding variants. It's beginning a pilot study to look at uh, genetic variation in non-coding sequences and how that impacts on disease, and also exploring issues around genetic context and environmental impacts on the outcome of mutations in disease genes. All of this will bear across the board on rare disease and complex disease. So in conclusion, uh, the IMPC has delivered mutants in nearly 10,000 mouse genes, over half the orthologous genome over the last 10 years, phenotype data from eight and a half thousand mouse lines. In 2018, we met our target of delivering mutants and phenotypes for one third of the coding genome. Uh, IMPC has now delivered data for half the orthologous genome. And I think, I hope I've managed to persuade you in this short talk that IMPC is truly illuminating the dark genome. It's providing new fundamental knowledge that will inform us about how genes and their associated variants are involved in rare and common diseases. And that will be a key underpinning uh, for future developments in genomic and precision medicine. And lastly, I just want to thank everybody in the IMPC across the, the globe. Uh, I couldn't possibly put up a slide with the hundreds of names of individuals that are involved across uh, the various centers. Uh, uh, but just simply to emphasize that the project is, is ongoing. And uh, I, if there's anything I can do to help you access the resources and the data to help you with your projects and you're delving into the jar genome, then please let me know. Anyway, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.